Jasvina Vadita Mastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om May the Divine Being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the Divine Being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. So good morning or good afternoon, I should say, and uh, welcome to our class on Swami Prabhavananda's interpretation and commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. The book is titled How to Know God and uh, perhaps someone can post where the page we're on. We're going to start again with Sutra 20. Page 50, Sutra, Brother Shankara. Page 50. Five, page 50, okay. Sutra 20, because this is such a, uh, this is such a pivotal Sutra. The concentration of the true spiritual aspirant is attained through faith, energy, recollectedness, absorption, and illumination. The concentration of the true spiritual aspirant is attained through faith, energy, recollectedness, absorption, and illumination. Faith is often used by agnostics as a form of abuse. That is to say, it is taken to refer to the blind credulity which a saint, which accepts all kinds of do's, uh, dogmas, which accepts all kinds of dogmas and creeds without question, repeating parrot-like what it has been taught and closing its ears to doubt and reason. Now, that is not, of course, what is meant by the faith that Patanjali is talking about. Such faith should certainly be attacked. It is compounded of laziness, obstinacy, ignorance, and fear. In other words, it is tamasic. That kind of faith is not generative of anything possible and is easily shaken. It is compounded of laziness, obstinacy, ignorance, and fear. Because it is rigid and unyielding, it can quite easily be shaken and altogether destroyed. I'm sure we've all seen instances of that. So is there anything anyone would like to remark from their own wisdom or experience? Or is there any concern or question that this raises at this point? We're going to we're going to go slowly through each one of these um, five qualifications 
that are mentioned. Faith, energy, recollectedness, so on. I took a yoga class this morning and the teacher read a quote from Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Is that the same as the yoga aphorisms of Patanjali? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. Precisely the same thing. So any, anything else from anyone? Thank you, Brahmadas, for clarifying that. Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. I think this um, blind credulity and uh, accepting dogmas without question is what um, leads one um, uh, to misinterpretation and misunderstandings of, uh, of many, many um, things. Yes, or oh, the, the, the acceptance of dogma and it's, the rigidity that goes with it makes it almost a certainty that you will misinterpret all of life because you're dealing from such ignorance and as the Swami says, laziness and obstinacy. You don't want to really reason about things. You don't want to deal with your doubts. So you simply box everything up and say, I know about that. And that's what's meant by the saying, judgment is just a way to keep reality at arm's length. When we box it up and say, I know about that, I don't have to think about it anymore. Then uh, it's a it's a very slippery slope indeed. Thank you, Swam. Anything else? Brother Shankara. Yes. So, so how does faith help me that uh, what I'm doing here is, uh, is the right path or is, is what, what will help me achieve what I want to? Which is it's, it's, it's by experience. It's by experience that we know. As we pursue the path, mm -hmm. things change for us. Okay. Though, though, though suffering does not cease, things change for the better. Okay. As economists say, the trend line is upward. So you see this in your own life and experience. Things are clearer to you. Things that were before mysterious or, or cloudy seem to you self-evident. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, you know, that uh, so people, there, there are many, uh, like uh, I would say, my, my parents follow a different path. My mom follows a different path. And... Uh, which I don't think they go that deep. And she has the same experience as I would say that I have that, you know, my, um, even though my suffering has not gone away altogether, but the experience is getting better. The experiences of uh, that, you know, uh, that I, I get less troubled about things. I am, uh, uh, that, you know, the, 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 the life is like a little, uh, what I would say is I'm less attached to the things. Yeah. Or attached to even life. So even she has same experience and we are for, both on a different track. Now, well, I don't know which, which is the right one. There is no, there is no right one, dear. There is no right one, capital R, capital O. There's the right one for you. Okay. And there's the right one for her. And as Sri Krishna says very clearly in the Gita, if you pursue any spiritual path with mm -hmm. sincerity and genuine heart, mm -hmm. he says, I will get right behind it and make it work for you. I will do that. And he is the doer of everything if we are to believe what, is, what he himself says in the Gita. So yeah. there is no right path for everyone. Mm 
That's why there are so many world faiths. And what is the test of the, the validity of a, of a path? According mm -hmm. to Vivekananda, it, it is, does it produce saints? And every one of the great traditions, the, the, the six darshanas in, in Sanatana Dharma mm -hmm. uh, and the other great world religions have all produced saints. Mm. And so this is, this is the test of their validity. But that okay. does not mean that we will not encounter doubt and fear. Mm. And this is why we take refuge in the great teachers and in their teachings. Thank you. Why, why it says of Sri Ramakrishna, thou hast finished with doubt and with fear, standing firm in the vision of God, refuge Refuge to what? To whom? Refuge to all who have passed fame, fortune, and friends away. Because that's the that's step number three on the the spiritual path. Thank you, Somesh. Anything else from anyone? All right, but this is not the true faith, the faith which is recommended by Patanjali. True faith is provisional, flexible, undogmatic, open to doubt and reason. So I'm going to read that again. What are the characteristics of true faith? But this is not the true faith, the faith which is recommended by Patanjali. The true faith of which he speaks is provisional, flexible, undogmatic, open to doubt and reason. The reason is, the reason for that is simple. <laughs> nothing, nothing can say the full truth, capital T in language or concept or thought. It is infinite. It is infinite. And you are an aspect of that infinity and you are unique. So your faith must be flexible, undogmatic, because you will encounter more and more and more. As Swami Brahmananda once said, light, more light, more light. Is there no end to it? No, there is no end to it. True faith is not like a picture frame, a permanently limited area for acceptance of acceptance. True faith is not like a picture frame a permanently limited area of acceptance. It is like a plant which keeps on growing, growing for, uh, throwing forth shoots, like a plant which keeps on throwing forth shoots and growing. As I said, the the truth is infinite and therefore absolutely undefinable. And your experience of it is your own because it comes through your own uniqueness. You will keep on throwing off shoots and growing. All we require at the beginning is a seed. And the seed need be nothing more than a feeling of interest in the possibilities of the spiritual life. Isn't that encouraging? All that is needed in the beginning is a seed, and the seed need be nothing more than a feeling of interest 
in the possibilities of the spiritual life. Perhaps we read a passage in a book which moves us. Perhaps we meet someone who seems to have reached some degree of wisdom and tranquility through the practice of meditation and spiritual disciplines. We become interested and intrigued. Maybe this is a solution for our own problems. Maybe it isn't. We can't be sure. We ought not at this stage be sure. We can't be sure. We ought not at this stage be sure. But we decide to give it a try. And this is the, this is step number one. We decide to give whatever it is that we have encountered that intrigues us a try. Any comments or questions? About uh, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Um, obviously, uh, we are now reading this in the context of spiritual life. But um, the seed, be, uh, seed need not be anything more than a feeling of interest in the possibilities. I would say that even if we take the spiritual world out and for life, that is true. Um, when, for example, when somebody goes to undergrad, they don't know what to major in, but they have an interest and maybe they decide to pursue that and then maybe change their mind later on and it goes on. Part of the problem in, um, uh, in the culture that, or the days that we are living in is changing paths, or at least in India, I guess, more than in the West, changing paths or uh, starting something, but then not liking and changing to something else is considered a failure. And that, um, actually is sad. Yes. It is very sad. And uh, it, 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 it eliminates the possibility for true self-determination. And these characteristics that were mentioned as the qualifiers for the true spiritual aspirant are all part of self-determination, true faith, energy, energy born of what? Energy born of motivation, motivation to do, be, create something more than you are, to share something more than you are at this moment. So the fact that changing paths is regarded as a failure is, uh, is tragic, really, because it discourages people from being self-determined, particularly when the culture and the family has so much to say about what path you choose. Thank you, Swayam. Anything else from anyone? Right before you started to read what he said about um, the seed and the interest, um, I was thinking, you know, about curiosity. It's about being curious about something. Yes. yes. Um, and he says in the beginning there's this seed of interest or curiosity necessary i think it becomes essential the the lifelong journey i think another tragedy speaking of tragedies is when we get to a point whether by age or years of practice or experience even where we go okay this is enough i've gone far enough this is it yep and that's why 
Vivekananda says, arise, awake, and stop not until the goal is reached. Well, some people don't know when the goal is reached, though. But, this, but, what, but underlying Vivekananda's remark is, you will know when the goal oh. is reached. You won't just, what, what you just described is what Vivekananda calls turning cheat. Oh, right, right. Just settling back and saying, this is far enough. I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll just tread water here or walk in place or turn the hamster wheel. Thank you. No, you know, I just wanted to also share because it reminded me of my grandfather who lived to be 94 and he was, uh, interviewed for the Charlotte, North Carolina Observer when he was 92. Um, he was a painter and it was the, revolving around his paintings being displayed and whatever. And, and the interviewer asked him for his advice for young people today. And he said, always marry for love and always follow your inclinations. Ah, exactly. I loved that word, inclinations. Cause yes, that, because that, the in, inclinations are of the heart. Yeah, and it's 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 not just it is curiosity and interest, but it's also something that's kind of pulling you and like you're inclining that right. way, and that's also, of course, a very important part of spiritual life. It's not just curiosity. If you don't have that pull. It's pulling you along, whatever you want to call that. Well, that's, that's not to be alone, that you know, pull so. that you're talking about is step number two, okay. and it has to do with finding reverence, finding reason to be reverent for that which has drawn you in that direction. So for the first step is the intrigue, the, the curiosity. The second is oh my god i have really found something whatever form it takes for you or formless aspect i have really found something this is awesome which is the dawn of reverence and that's the second step okay anything else thank you cindy Anything else from anyone? It seems like a common sense a little bit. Trust, but verify. That's a common sense. Exactly. Component. Exactly. And, and if I take Swayam and what Cindy just said, I would probably add trust, but try and verify or trust and have curiosity and inclination. Try and verify something like that. But yes, yes, sense. yes. All of that. All of that, and however it arises for you, whatever gives you the energy to move on, to get off the dime, as my granddad used to say. I first heard the term trust but verify during the Reagan administration, so it might have been Reagan that coined that term. But no, no, it's much <laughs> older than that, dear. Okay. It's, uh, it, 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 it's rooted in such sayings as in Islam, trust Allah, but tie your camel to a post. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but I think our interest in the possibilities of spiritual life includes when we hear about samadhi, it sounds so wonderful, or possible release from samsara, yet they seem so far away. Ah, but remember what Swami Prabhupada said, you who come and stick on, that is pursue this for at least a couple of years with some curiosity and energy. Hmm? You I who try come to and stick on are just a hair's breadth away. He said, you have no idea how close you are because you have no idea how powerful what it is that is in you has generated this curiosity and energy. And it is on the move. 
and so the best we can do is is stand aside with all of our preconceptions and say whoa what's on what's up here i'm working on a poem about this very thing right this minute i mean just today okay looking forward to hearing the poem uh, who knows how long that'll take but yeah yeah okay so here's what the swami says suppose you are subject to indigestion one day you read a book about diet or meet a doctor who tells you that he can restore he can restore your health if you follow his instructions you do not have to accept the book or the doctor with blind faith but you have to have provisional hypothetical faith you have to assume that the diet will help your condition you have to try it before you can say with authority whether it is helpful or useless so too with spiritual life with the spiritual diet which the great teachers recommend and as we've been all over this you know, the great teachers recommend various diets swami vivekananda formalized them as the four yogas that he left us with each one of these is a spiritual diet it's a workbook and if you if you are attracted to it and you do it and you do it with diligence and energy and regularity it will produce remarkable results so each of these great teachers you know patanjali and narada shankara uh sri krishna for karma yoga they each leave us with a workbook which workbook appeals to you you have to follow the spiritual diet which the great teacher recommends the one that you have selected and as swayam points out if you get somewhat down the path and say this really isn't working for me I think I'll try something else. Sri Ramakrishna says that's a great idea as long as you don't just keep doing it, which means that you're well, as in his metaphor, each of your wells will be too shallow to reach the true living water. So you have to try it long enough to know whether it really works for you or not. You have to have provisional faith in the truth of the scriptures and in the word of your teacher. Also, now that's the end of the faith component. Anything else that was the first of the five qualifiers. Anything else about faith from anyone? How would you define provisional faith? The provisional means I'm trying it to see if it works. Okay. I'm, I don't blindly accept it and say, I know it's true, therefore I don't have to do anything. No, the great teacher or the, the somehow it's come to me that this particular spiritual path will lead somewhere for me so i'll give it a try provisionally i'll give it a try and swami brahmananda said don't be faint of heart it may take two or three years for you to achieve any real great results but anyone who isn't willing to work for two or three years with the possibility of changing their entire life is probably not motivated enough 
It's not that they're a bad or wrong person. They're just simply still too immersed in the ignorance and in the attractions of the ignorance that they're practicing to sustain something for two or three years. So that's provisional faith. Thank you, Brahmadas. I'm glad you clarified that for us. Anything else? Um, Brother Shankara? Yes. Um, I'm forgetting the name of this author or the title of any of his books, but basically um, the thing just is that it takes about 20 years uh, to become an expert in any particular field. Yes. Um, and uh, so if one says, okay, if the first 20 years are just um, kind of getting to know the, and this is, I guess, more for the, uh, you know, our worldly thing, maybe. Um, and if an average lifespan is um, 80, then maybe you have three, three chances, like three things to try out. Well, you have, like you have the four houses of, of, Sanatana Dharma, Brahmacharya, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, and Moksha. That is to say, your student years, your householder years, your retirement years, and then when you're systematically letting go of your worldly responsibilities, that's Vanaprastha, and taking on spiritual responsibilities. And then that fourth uh, quarter of your life, uh, in which you uh, pursue nothing but spiritual uh, and are given the freedom by your family and others to pursue nothing but the spiritual. These, this is the ideal uh, within Sanatana Dharma, commonly called Hinduism. So, yes, and is that book that you are quoting, is that the book, The Outliers? Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay, it's a recommended reading for anyone who is curious about those people who create extraordinary success and what it what it takes to do it. Uh, it is it is a wonderful book. I don't remember the author's name, but uh, it is. Uh, uh, Swayam, you're an MD. How long did it take you to become an MD? Oh gosh, um, I, I would say same, like 20, 22 years. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's how long it takes to become, uh, by the time you're fully qualified, to become a practicing MD is somewhere between 15 and 20 years. That is a, that is quite a commitment. And in our society, yes, that commitment is well rewarded. So each of these things, as Swami Prabhavananda would say, holding out his left hand, he would say, you have so much energy, just so much energy to devote to your life. This life will just last so long and there's so much energy in it. He said, you can expend it on worldly pursuits. And if you use your head and are careful and thoughtful and, and disciplined, you will achieve remarkable worldly success. And then he dropped that hand and hold out his right hand and say, or you can devote that energy to spiritual pursuits, to spiritual freedom, to true happiness. And he said, the same thing is true. If you devote that energy to spiritual life, we're about to talk about the energy component here. If you devote that energy to spiritual life, you will succeed. And he was absolutely unqualified. And you could feel that there was a triple underline under you will succeed. 
if you devote those same characteristics of energy, discipline, thoughtfulness, carefulness to spiritual life, you will succeed. Thank you, Swayam. Uh, the name of the author I just looked up is Malcolm Gladwell and the Outliers, author of Outliers. Yes. Malcolm Gladwell. And uh, my absolute admiration and reverence for your retrieval memory, Brother Shankar. I had forgotten the title of the book. Well, it, 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 it is a, a, a book that uh, really got my sister's attention, Janice's attention. She, she brought it to my attention some time back. So we're going to go ahead with the second characteristic now as defined in Sutra 20, what is required. Also, you have to have energy. And that's just one simple sentence of six words. Also, you have to have energy. In other words, this isn't something that you do Mondays and Thursdays and Sunday morning. You have to devote your energy to it regularly. Without energy, you cannot follow any kinds of instructions day after day and really test their virtue, value. I'll read that again since I read it poorly. Without energy, you cannot follow any kind of instructions day after day and really test their value. Buddha pointed out that interest, oh no, if Buddha pointed out that if there is any sin, it is laziness. And Swami Swahananda, the Swami that sent me here, talk about a blessed soul. He did not like the word laziness. He never liked to be to to somehow criticize anyone in any way. He would say, "No, it's not laziness. It's just that they haven't found any reason for motivation. They haven't found their and this is the word he loved. They haven't found their zeal." So, what do we do? with such a person? Do we try to tell them where to find it? No, 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 hopeless. We pray for them. We pray for them. May they find their way to the path through the forest. And may they say, oh, I've found the path. And, and have that zeal to follow the path. Life is a forest, and it can be a dark forest. So we, we, when we find people who are discouraged, daunted, without zeal, this is what Swami Swahananda would say. Be as helpful as you can to them. Don't try to tell them what to do. Pray for them. Buddha pointed out that if there is any sin, it is laziness. As we have seen in discussing the gunas, tamas is the lowest condition of nature and the human mind. Tamas is the lowest condition of nature and the human mind. But luckily for us, energy is like a muscle. It grows stronger through being used. This is a very simple and obvious, yet perpetually amazing truth. Every creative artist knows those days of apparently blank stupidity and lack of inspiration on which he has to on which he has to force himself to work 
Now the Swami is using the example of a creative artist. We are all the creative artists who are creating our lives. So we all know those days when we have to force ourselves. And some days we don't. And so Swami Vivekananda says, we fall a thousand times, we rise a thousand and one times. And then suddenly, after hours of toiling, what is it? Ah, after hours of toiling, the effort is rewarded. Ideas and enthusiasm begin to flow into him. In all our undertakings, the little daily effort is all important. <laughs> as as uh, Thomas Edison said, it's 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration. Or as somebody else said, and I don't remember um, who it was that said this, something like 90% of winning the game is showing up. Or as my granddaddy used to say, you can't win if you don't play. A little daily effort is all important. The muscles of our energy must be continually exercised. Thus, gradually, we gain momentum and purpose. And this is true in spiritual life. If you, once you begin, as Sri Krishna says in the Gita, sour toil at first and then nectar and the transition of course is a spectrum sour toil at first and then a little nectar still a lot of toil then less toil more nectar more momentum, more feeling of purpose, more enjoyment. Hmm? As faith increases through personal experience and energy grows through practice, the mind require the mind acquires a direction. It becomes recollected. Now we're moving on to the third. So anything at all about energy. So we've discussed faith. Now the Swami has presented us with the case for energy. Anything at all from anyone, from your own wisdom or experience about energy, or any concern or question you'd like to raise. I found it interesting that your Swami Swahananda, who I never met, but he said you had only so much energy and it and he's no 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 that was Swami Prabhavananda. Prabhavananda, okay. Prabhavananda, that was Swami Prabhavananda speaking from the podium in the Hollywood temple. Uh no Swahananda is the one who said he didn't like the word laziness. Right, okay. Uh, and uh and uh, said no no it's it's lack of motivation and they haven't found their zeal. And he wouldn't condemn them. He wouldn't, he wouldn't hear any condemnation of people in that state. I think that's a wonderful teaching, really. Thank you, Bala. I do too. Mm -hmm. That's why it made a mark on my heart. Yeah. And, the, and he'd said you have this energy in the left hand, which is devoted to worldly pursuits. And then at one point, you've got to decide to move it over to the right hand to pursue your spiritual pursuits. Well, and yes, it, it, it isn't. It, actually, the decision arises 
when we encounter what the Swami talks about in the very beginning of discussion of this sutra, something intrigues you, something catches your attention. And so you think there's a possibility. Then there begins to be the motivation to move your energy away from worldly pursuits and to spiritual pursuits. As Tukaram says, only a fool would kick a lover out of bed unless he knew, hey, unless he had, only a fool would kick his lover out of bed unless he knew he had two more on the way. Well, that doesn't sound like the most spiritual of things, but I Oh come on. <laughs> don't don't be don't be prissy and pious. Tukaram is funny and 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 he means to be funny in a spiritual sense. He's talking about the ego. He's talking about the ego. Don't uh, let go of the ego until you have some sense that there's something better. Mm. Um you you have to and this is what this is exactly what Swami Ranganathananda says in Divine Grace. Fully manifest the gifts that you've been given. Then you'll find the lover, Hari, taps you on the shoulder. Krishna on the, taps you on the shoulder and says, see, it's been you and me all along. Now I have something even more to show. So, yeah. Uh, just like you said, it gets attention. Another friend, spiritual friend, she says about uh, attention deficit. We read a lot about uh, the condition of attention deficit where you can't attend to something and your mind is always shifting. I mean, you even use it very uh, loosely and casually when we ourselves can't concentrate. And she would say, no, no, no. It is not attention deficit. It is that your heart has not caught on to something. Once you latch on to something, your attention really catches on to something, then you will see that you're the most concentrated. And I've seen that in my personal life too. What we yes. love, we can go on doing for hours and what we don't like, we're fidgeting. Yes. Well, this is exactly, you've just said in different words, the same yeah. lesson that Swami Swahananda taught. Yes. You know, he it's not Swami it's not about him. it's not about somebody being bad and wrong yeah it's about it's about they just haven't found that which will cause them to release their attachment to ignorance yeah i mean that's love this about Bra swami swahananda and this friend kate and they have such a big and large picture of what no labels yes. you know and and this the secret the the secret is the word that you used, Amar Pali. The secret is the heart, the heart. That's where we have zeal. The mm -hmm. mind, the mind is full of arguments and doubts and fears and confusion and ignorance. And it isn't that it's there's anything wrong. This is just the sum of all the mental impressions that have been gathered all of these many many forms and lifetimes that we've lived according to the teachings yeah. so there's nothing wrong so with brother it. shankara that's where another question comes sometimes i feel the blind i understand blind faith can be very uh, like swami swami was saying sometimes you can be very dogmatic and all that because you have blind faith you're just following without realizing but there is some virtue about the some of my friends have this faith I won't call it blind, but they have this intrinsic deep faith. Like they have their puja rituals and all this. And I am now beginning earlier as to think it funny, but now I'm beginning to understand that these rituals also bring you back to your concentration. And sometimes that faith is very helpful. Whereas well, it's I'm exactly what the Swami is going to talk about next. The, the pujas cause you to be recollected. And in that recollectedness, there is experience. This is where they're getting that faith. A puja, doing a puja. You simply cannot be scatter-minded and do a puja. 
you have to collect your mind. And so, yes, there's great virtue in puja. Just ask Aditya, Aditya Chaturvedi, who is a surpassingly good pujari. He can collect himself and focus himself and be so present to what he's doing. And believe you me, it also underlies the other success in his life. And he says so himself too. This isn't just me interpreting it. So yes, puja. Puja gives you faith, no doubt, because of the experience you have of recollectedness. There are many ways of recollectedness. Puja is a bhakta's way. Mm -hmm. It's partly bhakti and partly karma. Karma Kanda. Anything else? Thank you, Amar Pali. All right, so nothing more about energy from anyone. All right. <clears throat> We've got about nine minutes left. We'll read on. When we Our energy grows through practice, and the mind requires require, a direction. Our energy grows as faith increases through personal experience, and energy grows through practice. The mind acquires a direction. Now, if you're headed in a particular direction, you have to focus on the direction you're going. I'll tell you something that is an absolute truth. This I learned in the Boy Scouts. When you're walking in the open, in the forest, or in a great meadow, set yourself a goal, a landmark out ahead. I'm walking toward that. Why? If you don't, you'll walk in a circle you'll walk in a great big circle if you do not set yourself this landmark and when you get there, set another. Why is that true? It's because one of your legs is shorter than the other. And that is an absolute physical truth. So you stay collected, you, your mind stays recollected, I'm headed toward that landmark. And when you get there, you set another one, even though you're lost. Even though you may be lost, because if you're lost and you don't set a landmark, you'll just walk in a great big circle. That is a physical truth. So the mind acquires a direction. It becomes recollected in the basic meaning of the word. Our thoughts have been scattered, as it were, all over the mental field. Now we begin to collect them again and to direct them toward a single goal, knowledge of the Atman. Now, this is the way it's talked about in Patanjali, and it's talked about in that, that way by the Gita, the Atman. In other scriptures and in other methodologies and other workbooks, there's no talk of the Atman. But it's all that spiritual, that highest spiritual goal that has a name for something that is nameless and formless. We don't know what we're talking about when we say the Atman. We have some sense about Saguna Atman, Atman in the in the as the as the knower of the field and as the the 
experiencer of our experiences. And we have some experience of that through the witness state. But it doesn't matter what we want to call it, knowledge of the highest spiritual truth, which in Patanjali is called the Atman. As we do this, we find ourselves becoming increasingly absorbed. Now we've moved from recollectedness to absorption. We've gone through faith, energy, recollectedness. What does this all add up to so far? As we do this, we find ourselves becoming increasingly absorbed in the thought of what we are seeking. In other words, our curiosity increases. Why? Because we're getting hints and allegations. Our lives change. Our thoughts change. Therefore, our speech and our behavior change. And so things are beginning to improve. We're not so scattered. We don't feel so confused. As we, as we, as is said in that, that interpretation of the Omasato bowl, of the Omasato prayer, Omasato Ma Satkama. We are getting some sense of that abode of silence, serenity, clarity, and peace. It is beginning to show up more and more in our lives. So I'm going to read that again. As we do this, we find ourselves, as we do what? Now we begin to collect our thoughts again and direct them toward a single goal, knowledge of the Atman. As we do this, we find ourselves becoming increasingly absorbed in the thought of what we are seeking. And so at length, absorption merges into elimination and the knowledge is ours. Now notice that the Swami doesn't say, maybe this will happen. No siree. He says, if you do these things at length, as absorption merges into illumination, the knowledge is yours. So anything at all, uh, I think we're going to leave it there. It's, it's 12.58, so that's a perfect time to stop because the next is Sutra 21. Brother Shankara, this is Haima. Yes, Haima. I truly agree with those last four lines of this 20, that he summarized everything in that. And once we, this energy gives us knowledge and then we knowledge about ourselves and then we find, understand the world better. We start understanding people around us better because we understand ourselves better. Yes, That's we understand exactly ourselves what better. better. We understand yes. them better. We love ourselves more. We love them more. Yes. Yes. We have greater compassion for ourselves. And yes. so we have greater compassion for them. And so the world changes for us. Yes, yes. Anything more, Heim? We don't look for external changes anymore. It's all happening internally. It's, it takes years of practice, though. It doesn't come overnight. No. It's like discipline, commitment, faith. First, we have to have faith. Then that, you know, commitment and discipline have to be there. Even every day, even five minutes of meditation, one day, if you can do one hour, even that day, maybe five, 10 minutes, it's okay, one day. And the next you get back to your routine. So we just have to, the meditation really, really leads to this. This is 
with all the Medi other things. Meditation, meditation is one path, and it's the one, one path. Yes, in Raja Yoga. But we do need uh, to have the knowledge of all the yogas. But it is really this recollectedness of mind yes. on what it is that we're driving toward. What is it that I think I'm driving toward? Then there, and we become absorbed in that thought. And that link, absorption merges into illumination and the knowledge is yours. Definitely, definitely. The peace and the bliss, it all comes to us. Thank you, Harm. Slowly, slowly. Anything else from anyone? Thank you. Doctor, I'd like to share something. Yes, Robert, uh, I was hoping to hear from you. I'd like to hear something from you. Well, I have noticed that uh, we, I, I'm personally getting a lot of benefit from this class. And I ran into a, a perfect example of it last week that I'd like to share with you. It's a group. I'm doing a commercial for a law firm and, and I'm the producer and, and I have to work with different teams of people doing different things. Uh -huh. and, and last week I was working with a person that was 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 continually uh, complaining about what we were doing and how we were doing it. And and I surprised myself and I didn't I realized after I had said what I'm gonna share with you that it came straight from this class. And what I said to him was this. I said, oh, well, what can you, you bring to this group just better? He said, well, I don't have anything that's better. So I, I said to him, I said, well, we stop right there. I said, don't bring anything to this group that, that you want to take away if you don't have something to replace it with that's better. And at that point, I recognized that came straight from, straight from here. Brilliant, Robert. That was just brilliant. And I'm glad you had the courage and the self-assurance to say it. By the way, for those of you who read the book Outliers, Robert Ayers is one of those outliers. Robert Ayers has put the energy into becoming what he is both as a musician and as a spiritual aspirant, uh, he is one of the outliers. So thank you, Robert. Thank you for that endorsement and that affirmation that these teachings show up in real life and make a real difference. Amen, brother. Wow, it was beautiful what you said. Yep. Very contrasting and constructive at the same time. Yes. Um, a reminder. But, but now I have I have included that in my life, in everything that I do. I don't take anything away if I don't have something to replace it with. This better. That's that's what Tukaram was is saying in that first opening lines of that poem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't don't take anything away until you got something better to replace it with. Right. And that's exactly what Ranganathananda says in Divine Grace. Manifest it all, manifest it all. Then you'll see, oh my God, I couldn't have done this alone. If I thought I was doing it alone, that was just my blindness. Anything else from anyone? Um, can I request Robert to repeat again what he told that person in his group? Because my uh, microphone wasn't working well, so I lost a little bit of that. Robert, what did you, what did, what did this person do, and how did you respond? <laughs> he was finding something wrong with the way we were doing things. He 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 was saying that we're doing it incorrectly. So I asked him. I said, "Well." How would you do it? Do you have a better way of, of, of doing this? Because if you I'm all ears. And he says, uh, no, I don't have a better way. I said, well, 
don't bring, don't take away anything that we have here. If you don't have something to replace it with, that is better. Thank you. And that's just brilliant. And and the the what you know the the great thing is that Robert had the courage to say this, and and uh, in his leadership position, not condemn the man, not say, you know, right. go away and shut up. <laughs> he just said, you know, you got something better. I'm all ears. And then when the man said he didn't have something better, Robert said, well. Well, then my instruction is, unless you have something better, don't try and take away something unless you have something better to replace it. And the one thing I added with him, I said, if, if I allow you to do that, then I have nothing now. Yep. Well, I, I you know, you confronted him so gracefully, Robert. Uh, you know, he was practicing that ignorance. You know, it's so easy, as Vivekananda says, it's so easy to tear down. But you know, it's I so think I think he got it and he went away with the same concept without even attending this class. <laughs> yeah, but he did attend this class because you, <laughs> you communicate that you communicated it to him so skillfully. Yeah. There is one at only one after all. And somehow things the, the Swamis and other teachings, they slip around in the world and and uh, get into these situations and, and make a difference. Anything else from anyone? That's why I think yoga and these yoga aphorisms are beneficial even in our career because they give us kind of ideas and a framework to approach life's challenges and difficulties. Yes. And you had mentioned you focused on a landmark in the distance. I like that analogy. However, we can't see God. We can't see the Atman. So we can't focus on that. No, so, but we can focus on those who have gone before us mm -hmm. you have you have a great teacher in swami yogeshananda what did he achieve look at this center he got the chapel set up uh, the the whole, this him. whole place is the result of the energy that he brought to this i mean i'm sitting in his old office that's where this little shrine is in Swami Yogeshananda's old office. He would have been so proud to see this little shrine. He would have been so happy to know that that had been created here in the time of COVID so that we could continue to practice together and have the shrine be part of it. So these are our landmarks the teachings that they left behind, the evidence of their presence. And my God, the man lived till a few days after his 99th birthday. And he was absolutely a shining beacon at the end. You can call and ask Swami Dhyana Yogananda in Trabuco, what was it like to be with Swami Yogeshananda right at the end? And he'll say, oh, he was just, he was just radiant. He was radiant. He wasn't sorry, he wasn't, you know, sure he was getting a lot of, of, of hospice care. So his physical ailments weren't troubling him that much. But was he radiantly looking forward to what came next for him? Yes, he was. So each of us has people like that in our lives that we can look to. There's a, there's a, 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 if you wanted, I often mention Swami Prabhavananda. There's a book here uh, in the bookshop called A Light to the West. A Light to the West. It's a book about the life of Swami Prabhavananda. Any of you who want a landmark, hmm? and he hasn't gone anywhere. 
And Swami Vivekananda said, where would he go? No, he is still with us and alive in the lives of those who devote their minds to praying for his presence. It's true of all the great ones. Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the other day, somehow one of Swami Prabhavananda's uh, Q&A um, sessions came on my YouTube feed. This is mm -hmm. the first time that I heard the voice of Swami Prabhavananda. Uh -huh. Such a loving and, I mean, kind and just, just, I didn't even listen to the words. I just listened to his voice. Yes. Just amazing. Yes, indeed, he is amazing. And there's a lot of Swami Prabhavananda out there on the web now due to the efforts of uh, Dharma Das, John Mundy, and his wife, Urvasi. Anna Mundi. John and Anna Mundi, Dharma Das and Urvasi, both disciples of Swami Prabhavananda, have worked and worked to create a, 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 a web presence for these great teachers, Prabhavananda and others, but especially, of course, for their guru. Anything else from anyone? Thank you, Swayam. So maybe a request for next time. I think starting Sutra 17, it's kind of building on something said in 18, 19, 20, and so on. If you wouldn't mind just kind of recapping that when you start next time, just so that I, I keep understanding the clarity. When you go through each one sutra, it's very clear, but then I think there's you mean, a sub, you mean, sub thread. You mean read, the, read Sutras 17, 18, 19, and 20 and comment on them? Yeah, Before give me a recap. Everyone. So, yeah, give me yeah, a recap so I can take it. Take, it's All building right. something, but I, I'm not, I, I get the sense, but I'm not fully getting it. Well, believe me, dear, getting it is decades of work. But getting it, getting a good grounding in it, I understand your request and will comply. But the getting it, having it really be part of your chitta, your mind stuff, and your heart's experience is decades of work. But Thank it you. can be done in this lifetime. Thank you. I'll do that next time. Any, anything else from anyone? All right, just a reminder, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock from the chapel, we will, I will introduce him, I'll open the meeting from here uh, on this computer, and then there'll be a, a computer and camera zooming him from the chapel. Any of you who can come to the chapel, You'll be glad to be in his presence. It would be a darshan. Uh, Gareth Young will speak to us. Gareth Young is an ordained Buddhist teacher uh, in the same lineage that Jack Kornfeld is from. And he will speak to us on the very Buddhist subject, but fits right into Jnana Yoga. Our study of Jnana Yoga, his topic is not knowing. So tomorrow morning, 11 a.m., Gareth Young from the chapel and on Zoom, um, not knowing. Well worth your time, I guarantee you. He's been a friend almost since I got here uh, nearly 12 years ago. Remains a close friend. Anything else? All right. Here is a prayer that we can repeat daily and an interpretation that comes from here. So I'll give the traditional translation and an interpretation of two of the three verses. The third one doesn't need any interpretation.
Om Hari Om Om Satoma Satgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mutyorma Amutangamaya Abir Abir Moiti O oh, dearly beloved Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from this realm of endless noise and relentless delusion to thine abode of silence, serenity, clarity, and peace. Lead us from darkness to light. Lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us from darkness and ignorance to the brilliance of thy wisdom and love. Lead us from death to immortality. Light us through and through, light us through and through with thy everlasting shining presence. Om Shanti, 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 peace, peace. Peace be unto us and to all beloved beings everywhere. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. And may we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. So until the next time we see one another, of course, there's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in classes next week and so on. And then the Swami will be visiting uh, on the 15th, on the 15th of the month. And please do plan to attend uh, either by Zoom or in person. On the 15th of May is the annual meeting of our congregation. We're very happy to be holding it again in the chapel, but it, it again will be Zoomed from there so that you'll be able to participate even if you can't be physically present. If you can be physically present, there's the invitation to a lunch that is uh, underwritten by your board of trustees, uh, a, a very tasty lunch after the uh, the annual meeting of the congregation. And uh, just look on the website, Facebook page, um, or see the newsletter for what the contents of the, of the annual meeting of the congregation will be. It's an, it's an interesting hour. Any final thought from anyone? All right, dears. Thank you all for your participation. Whether you say anything or not, the current of our studying the art of spirituality together very much flows and is felt. So to those of you who do share, thank you. To those of you who are silent, know that you too are sharing. Uh, there is one only one behind the appearance and we are feeling your presence. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai.